Glass is a director of the International Security Program at the Shaw School of Government and Policy at George Mason University. Uh, she's also former president and CEO of the Stimson Center, and she has been serving as a board member for um, the International Advisory Council of the International Institute of Strategic Study, IISS, and the American Diplomacy Center Board of Trustees. She had a 25-year career in the government, and she used to advise the Obama's intelligence board, so I'm sure her expertise will come through this presentation. Let's welcome her to the podium. Thanks so much, Professor Kwan. I'm delighted to see you all this afternoon and hope this will be a useful and informative uh, conversation once we've finished with our, our opening presentations. So as you know, the title of today's event is Asia and Beyond. So I'm going to start with the beyond part. So I'm going outside of Asia, or at least a country that's in the twilight zone between the Middle East and Asia, to look at Iran. Uh, you know, I think that sometimes analogies can be misleading or can be unhelpful. Uh, I think the uh, recent invoking of the Libya analogy to the North Korean case has been mostly unhelpful. But in the case of Iran, I think it is still useful to analytically see the connections between <coughs> what the country themselves has done and U.S. policy, so that Iran and North Korea are really the two acute cases of countries that are uh, more defiant or non-compliant with the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And how the Iran case has been handled in the recent uh, years, I think, is somehow illuminating of some of the challenges that will face the administration if diplomacy with North Korea uh, proves to be at least creating some new progress and new um, momentum in the direction of limiting and eventually perhaps uh, scaling back entirely uh, the nuclear weapons capabilities of North Korea. So President Trump promised in his campaign uh, that he would deal with the Iran agreement, which he believed was a deeply flawed agreement. Uh, the international community, led by the European Union, but including um, Germany and the permanent five of the UN Security Council, so Russia, China, UK, France, US, plus Germany, and Iran, from 2013 to 2015, engaged in a very serious and intense and difficult uh, negotiating process to get Iran back in compliance with the NPT. So here, right away, is a, one difference from the DPRK. Iran was still a signatory of the NPT, but had, was no longer in compliance. And the purpose of those negotiations was to get them back to be a, a, a good in good standing as a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The DPRK, as you all know, chose to withdraw from the DPRK when it accelerated its program and completed its, uh, its weapons project. Uh, so each case is a little bit different, but I think that these two countries, Iran and DPRK, have been the two that have been challenging the international community on how do we continue to enforce and validate the, the broad principles and purpose of uh, the global governance of nuclear weapons. And that, after all, is what the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is, is designed to do. Um, so, you know, Iran, as I should just mention, India, Pakistan, and Israel are the other countries that are nuclear capable and outside of the NPT, either because they didn't sign it or because they are simply um, uh, not in compliance. But I think the next question we should think about is um, what motivated Iran to uh, agree to all the measures that were contained in the agreement uh, signed in June 2015 called the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive uh, action plan. Uh, I must be missing a word there, JC, uh, Joint Comprehensive um, Plan of Action uh, is what the, the acronym stands for. Um, so some people think it was all about economic pressure, that it was really because sanctions, very strict sanctions that were both uh, U.S. sanctions but also U.N. Uh, sanctions were really having an impact on the Iranian economy. Uh, I think that is certainly worth noting, but I don't think we'll know until historians can go back and study this a, a bit more, whether that was the only or the determining factor. I think it was also that Iran had achieved its goals, that Iran had demonstrated its capacity to be a nuclear-capable country, but made a policy choice to stop short of full weapons uh, 
deployable weapons capability. Iranian uh, negotiators were often telling uh, the, the rest of the world, it's really the Japan model that we're interested in. We're interested in demonstrating that we have indigenous uh, manpower and knowledge to produce nuclear weapons, but we choose to not go that extra uh, step and we would wait until there was some truly existential threat to our country and then we would uh, consider making that, that policy choice. Again, unlike the DPRK, which went all the way to uh, full weapons capability. Uh, President Trump uh, complained during the presidential campaign and then was very consistent once elected in uh, once he came into office in early 2017, that he didn't like this agreement. It was never clear whether he actually read the agreement or knew all the details in it, but he didn't like it because it was not comprehensive. It only dealt with Iran's nuclear activities. It did not deal with Iran's regional destabilizing activities in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, uh, in various places, Iraq. Um, and it did not deal with the other things about Iran's behavior that were unacceptable uh, to at least some Americans, such as their human rights record at home, uh, their imprisonment of some American citizens, etc. So Trump's main criticism was that the agreement was, was too narrow. Why reward Iran uh, when it hasn't yet, when it's, when it's really gotten off scot-free on these other problematic aspects of its behavior? More specifically, the Trump administration criticized the sunset provisions, so within the 15 years of the agreement, uh, certain activities were banned for 8 years, or 10 years, or 15 years, but eventually some of the restrictions on Iran's <coughs> enrichment activities would be lifted at certain points. And at the end of the 15-year period, Iran would be back in good standing with an NPT and would no longer be uh, in the penalty box and no longer be subject to any of these uh, prohibitions and restrictions. The Trump administration also believes that the Iran agreement inspections and verification uh, characteristics were not strong enough, that the agreement did not deal with ballistic missiles, which of course can be either conventionally or nuclear armed, and they were unhappy with Iran's ability to spend the, the revenue that was returned to Iran, that was actually Iranian assets that had been frozen uh, for possible use in its uh, regional activities. Now, previous administrations had also struggled with, uh, but particularly the Obama administration, with what to do about Iran's nuclear program. Um, but they generally avoided what was sometimes called the grand bargain approach, or the comprehensive, put all of the issues on the table at once. Um, because it was the price would be too high, and that the feeling was that in the end, Iran would not really seriously engage, that Iran would pocket some early concessions and not necessarily follow through. It was the lack of trust, I think, that made uh, the administration be wary of a, a grand bargain approach. Uh, I was involved a little bit in some of the early options of, in the Obama administration, and President Obama, after considering three or four options, decided that Iran's nuclear activities were, in fact, the most significant, the most relevant to American interests and to the concerns and interests of our partners and friends in the region, namely Israel and the Gulf Arabs. So he made a very explicit, conscious choice to say, let's deal with the nuclear issue first, and then if we have success there, we can move on to these other issues. Uh, that was very much an approach that the Trump administration uh, disagreed with. Um, so, in early May, the President uh, announced that the United States was no longer uh, in, uh, committed to this agreement. Uh, it is an international agreement, it's not a bilateral agreement, so the dilemma immediately uh, came for the other signatories to the agreement of how do they try to keep uh, the, the aspects of the agreement in, uh, in place, even though the country that is perhaps the most important country in that uh, negotiation process has now uh, stepped outside of the uh, compliance. The administration has also reimposed some of the sanctions by the president not continuing to suspend sanctions. A lot of bilateral U.S.-Iran sanctions have now been reimposed and the Trump administration is introducing additional sanctions, um, particularly against the ballistic missile program um, and, and some other activities. So more Iranian companies are being named as uh, prohibited um, 
actors. Uh, the question of whether the administration intends to uh, really enforce secondary sanctions so that other countries that trade with Iran would be punished is a little bit in play. I think in the early days the administration sent very mixed signals about whether the secondary effects of U.S. sanctions on European or Asian trading partners uh, would be uh, important to them. But it's now clear that um, most major trading partners uh, with Iran are going to voluntarily choose to comply with the U.S. sanctions rather than uh, run the risk of facing litigation by the U.S. Treasury. Uh, so the, the next data point that we have about new U.S. policy towards Iran, and I'll very quickly get to how immediately relevant this is to North Korea, is a speech at the Heritage Foundation by our Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo. Uh, some people have characterized his speech as magical thinking, that it has laid out an ambitious plan that is almost certainly unachievable uh, for the U.S. and Iran. Uh, the, his speech hints at regime change as a desirable uh, avenue for the U.S. to explore. It says that the uh, President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif, who of course were the great advocates for the agreement and fought the more revolutionary forces in Iran to get approval of the agreement, that they are still part and parcel of this evil system and that the poor suffering people of Iran really need change and the suffering people of Iran can be friends of America when the circumstances are right. So um, the uh, Pompeo speech also says that our Iran strategy will now be executed outside of the JCPOA. And he basically has a 12 point list of all the things that will be uh, of greatest concern, to the, of greatest interest and priority for the Trump administration. Almost all of them are things that have already been done or have been done. But I thought that seven of the 12 were particularly relevant to where we may end up with North Korea. So let me just quickly go through these. Um, uh, one, declare to the IAEA the military dimensions of its nuclear program. Two, stop enrichment and never pursue plutonium reprocessing. Three, give the IAEA total access to all sites in Iran. Uh, four, end proliferation of missiles. Five, release all U.S. citizens. Six, um, end support to any terrorist groups that the regime may support. And last, uh, end the threatening behavior to its neighbors. So any of those, uh, of that whole list is at least partially um, relevant to the kinds of things that will be on the table in uh, talks with, with North Korea. So, uh, and Pompeo himself in his speech says, if anyone doubts the president's sincerity, let them look at our diplomacy with North Korea. Our willingness to meet with him underscores our commitment to diplomacy to help solve the greatest challenges, even with our staunchest adversaries. And it is uh, our painful, the painful pressure campaign that reflects our commitment to solve this challenge forever. So it's an interesting illumination of how the administration may also want to approach North Korea. Keep economic pressure on until concessions are made by the other side, but um, virtually all these features of the Iran agreement in one way or another, the Iran agreement that the Trump administration has repudiated, many of the components of that agreement will almost certainly be on the table if we enter serious diplomacy and negotiations with North Korea. Thank you. Thank you for I think this gives a sort of a broader way for us to think about um, the upcoming summit and negotiations to come. I think U.S. Uh, pulling out from the Iran deal may give a negative message to North Korea at this point of time, so I was wondering whether she can follow up on this during discussion how North Korea may perceive this particular um, particular action coming from the Trump administration. Thank you.